This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by State Farm, who has surprisingly great rates for your auto insurance. In 1999, my mom recorded me in our family room, delivering the lines for what I thought was a horror movie. My mom read the other roles, and I thought she gave a much better performance than I did. There was even a moment when I seriously considered not sending the tape because that would require a trip to the post office and an entire day's salary for postage. Not that I had a paying job. I was surprised when I received a phone call asking if I could audition in person. Then I realized that the casting director must have mixed up my tape with someone else's. I could have pointed out the error, but I'd never been to LA and wanted to go. So my parents gave me airline miles and I flew to Los Angeles, Burbank actually, where I auditioned every day for a week and slept on three different couches. At the week's end, my friend with the least comfortable couch offered to drive me to the airport. And because at the time it was hard to find good Mexican food in Washington state, I wanted one last burrito. My pager began buzzing just as our nachos arrived. There was a payphone in the back of the restaurant, and when I returned the page, I was told that I got the role. It was one of the biggest surprises of my life. I was also surprised to learn that Scary Movie was actually a comedy. This was after my audition. Speaking of nice surprises, State Farm provides coverage that meets your needs at a surprisingly great rate. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Hey, dear listeners, today's guest is the incredibly talented director, writer, producer, and actress Elizabeth Banks, who you know from Charlie's Angels, The Hunger Games, Pitch Perfect, 30 Rock, and a million other things. I really hope you enjoy our talk. I hope it's a welcome distraction from everything going on. I like to tell myself that you are all safe indoors and healthy. I know that's wishful thinking. Just know that I'm thinking about you. Meanwhile, please reach out to us here at Unqualified. Send us your questions, your answers, and your stories to our website, unqualified.com. And now here she is, Elizabeth Banks. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. How are you doing, like, in the quarantine? Are you homeschooling yet? What, are you on spring break? I think my son has been homeschooling me more than I have been him. But we are, our show is off for the season. We took an early hiatus yeah. and everything. Um, and what about you guys? I know that, like, a lot of movies have been sort yeah. of... We were not in the middle of anything, and we we have a, a writer's room that's up and running, which is great. I have a show coming out, Mrs. America, in April on FX on Hulu. So that was already happening. Who's in that? That's one of these great ones where I got to go work with like so many amazing women. I'm so happy about. I love it that you do that. You, you've <laughs> been such a pioneer when doing press for as a director. What tend yeah. to be the most annoying questions? I mean, like, as a female director, is it so female-centric? It's hard. It's really hard. It's hard because you get a lot of, look at you, feminist. And you're like, I'm just trying to be a filmmaker. I just happened to tell a story about a bunch of women. I don't know. You know, back in the day, Jane Campion, I'm sure, was not asked, like, you made the piano with this female star and this little girl in a Paquin. How, what is your big feminist statement? It's like, it's hard because you, at the same time, the journalists, I feel need validation that women are doing better, right? That's so <laughs> that, generous that I of am you. A, a beacon of some <laughs> sense of hope, right? Right. So, so I don't want to dismiss it, but I also, I didn't sign up to direct movies because I felt like I was meant to make some grand feminist statements and gestures, you know, it's really not why I'm doing it. So I do find that the messaging can cloud what the movie is and what the work is that I'm actually doing. I do not get asked a lot about like lenses or, you know, cinematography or any of the sort of technical (laughs) stuff that I obviously also have to master to direct like big, huge productions. I find that really fascinating. Like no one's interested in that. I was wondering if you ever got asked like, Ooh, did you like doing the action sequence and Charlie's like, like all that kind of shit that they would never ask. (laughs) Like, 
I've been asked that. The three times I think I've been like actually offended because it takes a lot to offend me. I love that about you. People bring their own shit to every interview yes. and you're, you know, you're just like, okay. I got asked on Pitch Perfect 2 who picked all the music. And I was like, yeah, so I got to pick all the music with my <laughs> music supervisor. Of course, I mean, there's a whole team that puts the music together. Yeah, but who decided what the songs were? Yeah, so I got to decide. Obviously, it's, you know, I directed the movie. I, I, it, the buck stops with me. I have to like pick the songs and, you know, figure out what the, <laughs> yes, yes, but like, who's the yes. Okay, well, you know that I just was like, do you really think it's impossible that I could have picked these songs? I thought it was so interesting. And I had produced the first movie, and I don't recall our male director, Jason Moore, who's brilliant. I don't recall him being questioned about if he had really done it. Do you know what I mean? Right. There was like this just, it, like this like, this poke, like, but you, but it wasn't really you. And then same thing kind of happened with the action sequences. It was like, you know, in Charlie's Angels, a bit of, so, but who came up with the action se- sequence? And, you know, I literally, like my name is on the script. So like, <laughs> I actually really did say like, I think it would be fun if we went to a racetrack and here's what I'm thinking happens at the racetrack. And then I have to write it down and then I have to communicate it and then we have to, I have to hire the right people. I have to choreograph it. And then we have to shoot it correctly. And then I have to edit it and put it in a movie. Like I actually did have to do all of that, but it was, it was interesting. Like there were people who were like, yeah, but I mean, second unit and, but you had it. There was someone else. I mean, so the stunt coordinator, he did a lot. You're like, what? I do know that casting was not your choice because I was told I was a contender. Oh, yeah, but totally. The you, studio I wanted to go If it were up to me, or? if it were up to me, of course, if it were up to me. Listen, Elizabeth, I can be a badass. I'm 100% clear on how badass you are. <laughs> the only other time I was offended was someone came in and said, you do so much, don't you ever just want to take a bath? And I thought, no, I don't. I mean, I just take showers anyway. I'm not really a bath person, but that's such a weird question to ask in a professional setting of a professional person. Don't you think that that is one step deeper? Like the first step is like, oh, I met with Elizabeth Banks. You know, we met up at this West Hollywood hotspot. She ordered a salad with sun-dried tomato. Or like (laughs) Elizabeth is slowly picking at her salad. It's like, okay, and then wait, don't you want to just take a bath? (laughs) I mean. Uh, (laughs) Salads and baths. But I will also say that I am Uh, grateful that I get interviewed about anything at all. I'm grateful I get to make things and that I get to tell people about it. And at the end of the day. I know. And I wonder too, though, if we are, are we supposed to be feeling more grateful? But because of people like you, people get opportunities. And thank you so much for being a trailblazer. Oh my goodness. You know, one of the things for me that came out of Me Too a little bit was I did feel a real sense of camaraderie with the women in my industry that I had not really felt before. There was all these sort of unspoken anecdotes and, you know, the idea of like, you go to a set and you're the only woman. I've rarely made movies where I'm an actor. I've now, as a producer and a director, been able to make movies with lots of women. But prior to that, prior to me doing it, the amount of times I went to a set with like a bunch of girls, that never happens. Never. And if there is another girl, we're pitted against each other character wise, usually. Completely. So- yeah. I just, I just find that, that the entire system is being, is being shaken or it's not. You get these really great moments where we shake things up, whether it's like when we got the right to vote, like a hundred years ago, we shook things up, you know, and then it's like, but then we didn't get the ERA and we, then we got Roe v. Wade, but like now Mm -hmm. maybe less than one generation later, we might not get it anymore. I just, it's like, to me, I, I feel like women are constantly reminded whether it's in as we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation, going to set and being like the only girl or like going to set and like the crew is, you know, whatever, 70% men usually standing around. You just realize like we live in a world that's built for guys. And so I don't think guys even understand. And I know my own husband very sweetly, like we've had these conversations where he's like, babe, I just, I am never gonna feel it on a deep level in the way that you are going to feel it because he's like, I can do what I want with my body. I have body autonomy. Like, you know, <laughs> it's never going to be an issue for me. Right. Like I can be a landowner. Like they're never going to take that away from me. And you know, you, just, landowner. You, think like, you think like, yeah, that's, that's what he's been taught. You know, I have not spoken 
much at all about the Me Too movement. And I feel really guilty about that because I, I have a lot of thoughts, but I, fe- I feel guilty because it, it felt to me like, what do I contribute? I think you can absolve yourself of that. I really do. I think that it's no one's job to be a spokesperson for anything other than our own experience and and even that like you don't owe that to anybody you don't owe it to your listeners to me I don't think you owe that to anyone that you don't want to tell those stories to and anyway I would just say like absolve yourself of that I don't think it's necessary that every single woman talk about it I and, I, and by the way I think it's obvious hashtag me too that every single one of us has seen too many dicks that we didn't want to see you know um, and that we've all they were all gorgeous in my experience <laughs> I just had so many like memory jogs during the initial days of me too where I was like oh yeah I remember that the thing that happened yeah to me. and that did feel oh, weird yeah. at the time yeah it felt a little funky at the time turns out it was <laughs> yeah it turns out everybody was experiencing that too okay cool cool yeah you know I think that's the other thing that for me at least Again, it was like that sense of camaraderie and all these sort of anecdotes. What I love about the moment, I, there's very few things that I love about social media and the data aggregators of the world. But one of the things I love is that because of big data, everyone, all of these things that were like, maybe this is happening, you know, maybe women are being uh, harassed at work. And then it's like, no, no, hey, take a quick poll. Hashtag me too. Look it up. We've all been harassed at work. Right. And so there's no way anymore for those in power to ignore the aggregate of big data at right. that level. Right. It's like you can't just dismiss it as sort of like, well, that's one girl or that's something that happened at this office or that was one guy who got accused. It's like, guys, this is a systemic problem that is deep and rooted in, you know, the way that we set up our world and, and, um, when we need to, sort of acknowledge it and and try and get through it and past it. I think that's the one thing that I like about sort of big data. That's an amazing way to put it. And I think you're completely right. What's been tricky for me, I think, like you, I, I'm not easily offended. So I don't want to be treated with any degree of preciousness. Yeah, um, yeah. Unless I'm doing a stunt. I mean, <laughs> but, I have, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't really found that. Meaning, I I have not been treated with a lot of preciousness. I mean, I'm a, I I think I I put people at ease pretty quickly. Anyway, yeah. we very much have like you know the cor- like a corporate structure too. For me, if people need to feel uncomfortable while we work through this, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been married for eleven years. Is that right? I've been married since two thousand three. So how many is that? <laughs> 17 years in July. I met him, though we've been together since 1992. And you guys met in college, first day of college? Yeah, I met him my first day of college. Yep. He was a year older than me. He was a sophomore. I was a freshman. Um, I met him in front of a frat house. When you first met your husband, did you think, oh, like frat douche or anything? I, I don't even know if, like, my mom hates it when I say douche. I don't even love that word that much. Not because it offends me, but it just feels not very creative. Um, but did you think, like, were you, was that a turn off? Like, how did the courtship yeah. go? Yeah, yeah. I think the word that I liked from that time period was tool. Yeah, so yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, yeah, he was definitely, he seemed a little bit like a tool to me. That being said, I was attracted to him pretty quickly. I think he was at the time when I met, you know, he was 19 when I met him. And I think all 19 year old guys that are in frats are tools. Like there's just no getting around it. Right. He was, he was a sophomore. All the freshman guys were like beneath him when he was a freshman. I think he knew it was kind of a bummer to be a freshman dude. And now, now that he was a sophomore, he was excited. So he definitely had an attitude. Like I know what's up and I'll, I'll show you the ropes and I'll take you around and I'll teach you stuff. And you know, I remember thinking like, okay. I know. I love your smile right now because it so seems like you had this on <laughs> lockdown and you're like, oh, you fool. 
you're not wrong. He was actually, he, we joke because he was really interested in this other girl, Kate. She was a twin. I think she was in the nursing school. She was the nicest girl, had an amazing voice, like a deep, cool voice. It was a great girl. I don't think was ever actually interested in my now husband, um, but he was definitely interested in her. And I knew that, and I was like, all right, cool, whatever. You don't think he was just saying that? No, like, I would have, like, I liked Kate. Like, everyone liked Kate. Yeah, but don't you think (laughs) that there's that thing that, like, guys are kind of taught, like, if when you really like a girl, you start talking about, like, another girl? Like, Neg? Yeah. That may have been a game. It may have been a little gamey. Maybe. I like that idea. Regardless, I think, like, within 10 days, we were on our first date. I ran into him a bunch of times after that first Meeting, and you know, it's not like I didn't go to a small school. I went to a really big school. So the fact that I kept running into him felt very <sighs> faded. Oh my God. So did you find out later that he was, that he kind of knew? No, no. It was just truly faded. Like he started rushing a guy that lived on my floor and we both were doing communications classes in the same building. You know, we would like cross each other and he, it's just crazy. I went to a really big school as well. You went to University of Pennsylvania, is that right? Yeah. I went to University of Washington, and I kept running into my ex-boyfriend all the time as well, but that was because I was stalking him, (laughs) you know? Like, I had quickly memorized his class schedule, and I would be like, oh, hey. So, oh, that's crazy. So how are things going? I actually, I had a boyfriend at the time when I went, well, I had a high school boyfriend um, his name was Brian. He was the best. He taught me so much about love. And, you know, I lost my virginity to him. And he was a sweetheart. He had a great family. Elizabeth, nobody has this story. I know. I know. I had, like, the best high school boyfriend. The so best. what happens then? And so we, we were drifting. I think neither one of us were, like, interested in doing long distance particularly. Me, I can admit, I was less interested in that than probably he was. He went away to school in the summer before I did, like a month before I did. And um, so by the time I got to school, I was already like, all right, I want to be a little bit of a player. I've done my high school boyfriend. I'm ready to rock and roll. I met my husband day one. And then I, but I was still getting calls from my ex, right? Who was at a different school. And we kind of broke up. It sucked. I actually went and visited him on this one weekend. I took a bus ride out there to see him, like a Greyhound bus, where I was like, all right, this is the weekend. We're breaking so you're, up. You're going to tell him, like... We're doing it. It was clear. We both knew it. I went. I met some of his friends. It was great. We did break up, and everything that that entails happened, um, and then... And then he started dating another girl who he dated for a long time. Like, we were just, we were right for each other. And he has a lovely life now and still has a great family and all those things. So it was, it was great. I love it that you took a greyhound to break up. I called my first husband over the phone. That's, (laughs) that's the kind of ex I am. (laughs) No, I took the greyhound. I went and saw him. I knew we were breaking up. I knew I was already, like, falling for my now husband I was so hungover on the bus ride. My husband had gotten me so wasted the night before. He had also given me a hickey. Nice. Oh. He had marked his territory. So I took a hickey to see my high school boyfriend. He's going to hear this. And I, I hope he does because I, I truly I adore him. What still was his day. name again? Brian. His name is Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, I hope you hear this. I think he will. I, well, like, how healthy is that? And it's annoyingly healthy, Elizabeth. <laughs> I mean, no, it's we wonderful. Were, I'm telling you, I had a great, I had a really great high school boyfriend. Yeah. Well-raised. Have you been heartbroken before? Well, he broke up with me. We'd been dating. I think I actually remember we'd been dating for 22 months because his high school number was 22. And I made him like a jello cake in a 22. And I brought it over. And his parents, I think, freaked out that we had been dating for 22 months, which is a long time, two years in high school. And then the next thing I knew, he, he had broken up with me. And I... I've never cried harder in my entire life, actually, than that. And then we got back together. <laughs> of course, because yeah. you got to do. We got yeah. back together. <laughs> Don't you think there's like that slow timeline of like, especially when you're dating somebody at that age, there's like the breakup and then getting back together for like a couple months and then another breakup and then getting back together for an even shorter period of time and then another break <laughs> and it's all dramatic and your friends have to listen to it. And it's like this slow weaning of your first, like, that dizziness of 
you know, narcissistic young love, I guess. Ah, uh, totally. And also that it's the most important thing in the world to you at that time. There's yeah. nothing else, you know, you can't see the future. You can't see past like two days, I feel like, when you're that age. I went to college for my boyfriend at that time. And then he broke up with me two weeks in after he joined a fraternity. And so then the stalking commenced. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that I knew that I didn't like a lot of things about him. You know, I, there were so many things that I didn't. I just didn't like. I didn't like his sense of humor. I didn't like his laugh. Ooh, those are big ones. Like, he was mean. Why? What What? What do you think made you want to stalk him? He was the first guy that liked me. I was a, very much a late bloomer. I didn't kiss anybody till I was 16, and that was a weird, like, slug-in-my-mouth moment. <laughs> so I didn't have a boyfriend until I was a senior, and he was really good looking. I couldn't believe somebody that good looking liked me. I mean, I had just cut my braces off. <laughs> I was ready for a cute guy to like me. Yeah. So it was all it was all about me. You know, it wasn't about it was about my identity with with that relationship as opposed to who he actually was. Yeah. He really yeah, liked yeah. Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> like worship, like ponytail, and Ooh. yeah, yep, had all the movies. Could do some wow. kicks, you know. <laughs> wow, maybe he's listening too. I hope um, both of our high school boyfriends are listening. Okay, so dating deal breakers. Ooh. Okay, if you were single, mm -hmm. he brings his own hot sauce to restaurants. Ooh, um, I mean, here's what I think. On the first, second, third, or fourth date, that's a deal breaker. That's crazy behavior. Once I think you know him and you realize he loves spicy food, it can be something kind of cute. And then even I would say further into the relationship, you can start bringing a little bit with you. I do have girlfriends that have it like on a keychain, which I think is kind of cute. I bring salt sometimes. Yeah. I think it's weird to lead with that. Yes. Like I wouldn't start with there. I do. I mean, that's a tricky one because it all depends on how charming that person is. Because yes. what if he like made his own hot sauce and he really wanted <laughs> to try it? I don't know. Well, that's, yeah. Okay. Uh, his best friend is an 18 year old. How old is he? Uh, let's say he's 36. No, that's an absolute deal breaker. <laughs> what is this? Kato Kalen living in the back? No, this is not allowed. That's not allowed. You cannot, your best friend cannot be that much younger than you. Yeah. yeah. Because then you're, I still don't understand what that relationship looks like. Like, are they, if they're doing things for you, then they're like your assistant. If they're, do you know what I mean? Like, I know people that are like friends with their trainer and I'm like, but you're paying that person. Like, that's not. That you can be friends with people that you pay money to, one hundred percent. But I, I don't think you can say like that's my best friend. I don't right. know. That feels that's a weird line. To yeah, me. yeah, it's weird. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> what about if he was a priest in his early twenties? Well, wait, a priest? You can't date priests. That was like the entire storyline on the last season of Fleabag. Retired though. Retired. Oh, well then, so no longer a priest. So realized he wants to get laid and have yeah. fun with women. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Then fine. Yeah, sure. All Retired right. priests. Great. I actually think they, they probably have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> this episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Best Fiends. We all know there really is only one match three style game worth playing. It's the one with an actual storyline, cool collectible characters, and non-stop action-packed adventure. It's the one with literally thousands of challenging puzzles to solve. And yes, I'm using the word literally correctly. Of course, I'm talking about best fiends. You meet your best fiends early in their careers. They don't have much experience, but they have heart. I recognized a little piece of myself in each of them. And so I began to assemble the perfect team. I watched them grow as we solved puzzle after puzzle, working hard and playing hard. Today, my best fiends are ready to go anytime and anywhere. I'm really proud of what they have become. With new challenges and levels added all the time, there's never a boring moment. So download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. I think we've loosely sort of framed this as how would you proceed in terms of directing. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm so curious. Okay, well, let's say, so you have spent four hours setting up for a big 
action sequence. And right before you guys are about to roll, sun's going down, whatever. (laughs) Your lead actor comes up and says, I don't know why my character would say this. (laughs) <laughs> so I've been on that. I've been in those moments. And here's the thing. That is work that absolutely should and needs to be done by you. That is literally your fucking job as an actor is to figure out why you do things. And that work needs to be done long before you show up to the set. I love it that you're looking at me like super <laughs> hardcore because you probably know I've done that sort of shit before. <laughs> Without meaning to, but it makes me fucking crazy when actors do that. It makes me insane. I mean, I've been on sets, I won't name names, but I've been on sets where that exact scenario, like four hours of setup, 200 background extras are standing around. It's, you know, it's freezing out. They call everybody to set and then suddenly the lead actor and the director need to like go to the trailer to have a (laughs) conversation about why he's doing something. And and the answer literally is like, because we already shot C, (laughs) <laughs> and we already shot A, and this is literally just B, and we just need to connect A and C. It's infuriating. Like, people have families to go home to. Like, get your shit together, do your work before you show up to set. Okay, let's say your financier is dating this gal named Veronique, and mm. you are kind enough to give her a line. Oh. On the day of her scene, wardrobe comes up to you and says um, that Veronique does not want to wear the red dress that she'd already been fitted and tailored in, mm-hmm. and it's not her thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love how, how big you're smiling right now, by the way, Elizabeth. <laughs> Every scenario you're discussing so far has been a scenario in my life. Actually, what I think I would do in that situation is, first of all, I want everyone to come to set feeling great and confident. So with wardrobe, hair, and makeup, that's usually a conversation I have. How great do they feel in it? Now, I can't have somebody come to set in a blue dress when the whole background's blue. Or like the red dress is a story point. Like she's got to wear the red dress. That's a different scenario. If somebody's just like, I feel bad in this and I don't feel confident, I don't know how I can do it. People are very insecure, especially young or inexperienced people in every industry, by the way, I'm I'm not even just saying that about actors, right? Like you have to get up and give a presentation tomorrow and it's your first time in front of the boss and the blah, blah, blah. And you're like sweating through your blazer and you feel like you, you tried on 17 outfits, right? That's literally, that's the same scenario that this is, that this is, I would just want that person to feel confident coming to set. And then at the end of the day, I would know because it's the, it's like the financier's girlfriend that I'm probably editing that line out of the film anyway. So, (laughs) (laughs) so it's not a big deal. It's a NBD, NBD. Her line is. I really think we got to get out of here now. Oh, well, that sounds like I might need it, but I can always ADR ADR it later. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Would you feel like doing some line reads? Ooh. Cliche movie quotes? (laughs) Like, let's bring you back to the days of auditioning. Oh, God. Okay. I'll be a casting director. I'm just going to simply read you a series of lines. Okay. All right. Um, Will you slate for us? Sure. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Banks. I'm five foot five, uh, SAG AFTRA. And yes, I will cut my hair. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Your first line is, What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Good. Sorry, I t- I'd like yeah. to take it back. What are you doing here? That's good. Okay. But imagine this is also somebody that you're overjoyed to see. Oh, sorry. I didn't no, no, no. It's okay. It script. is a horror movie. It's fine. Okay. What are you doing here? Okay. The next <laughs> one is, You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Okay. Hold on. I, I know you wanted the German accent. I love the idea of a German accent, but I also want it to be truly like this person has just come up with um, like solving something. In, you know what I mean? Like it's earnest. Okay. Okay. German okay. earnest. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? What do you think? That was very sexy. Mm. I do want you to do You've Got to Be Kidding. Oh, that's right. Sorry. I was on the wrong no, line. No, no, that's okay. No, I'm glad you have the first line down. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, no me, because it's not about you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the first next. First of all, this is the fact that it's like, Pete, I can see that you and I are laughing and think this, this is funny and no one else is going to realize. And they're just going to be like, why is Liz Banks doing a weird accent on this podcast? What is happening? 
<laughs> what about why am I not surprised? Question mark. Why am I not surprised? Why am I not surprised? Oh, that's good. I know you do a lot of um, animation, right? You do yeah. some animated voices. I love doing it. I do too, but don't you find that it's hard? It's such an amazing job for many reasons. And you work for four hours. <laughs> but I'm beat after it. Are, do you find yourself oh. totally like, yes. l- like creating a character kind of by yourself, trying to round out the vocals? It's an intensive process. Yes, it's exceedingly intensive. You have to bring so much to it because you're not, you can't rely on anything else, right? So there's no one to bounce off of. There's no one with you. It's why. So what I was going to say is, I love. I do a three in a row every single time. So I'm always like, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Like, and then I you're like, constantly, yep. And I'm like, oh, do we get it? Please tell me we got <laughs> it. <laughs> I, Ellen DeGeneres. Um, I was promoting my first animated movie, and I said basically something similar to that. Like, well, you know, it was it? she was like, how was it? And I was like, you know, I know everyone talks about what an amazing job it is, and it is, but it was also more difficult than I thought. And she said, well, it's not like you're digging ditches. And I, in yeah. my memory the audience stood up and clapped like <laughs> that's what happened in my memory in that moment like where do i go Aww. like of course it's like an amazing job and i'm not digging ditches <laughs> yeah but that implies though that we can never talk about what we do and i think that's a bummer i know you're right you're right that's an interesting way to put it because there is the, that feeling of especially during this time too there's this feeling of like we're so fortunate to have a bunch of you know canned chili and yeah pasta in our pantry and toilet paper although we're running pretty low on the paper towel situation <laughs> We, we just ordered a bamboo uh, toilet paper because it was the only Ooh. thing we could order. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't touched it. I, everything that comes to the house, I, I pretend is like radioactive and it has to stay in the garage for like a week. Yeah. Because that's what we're, that's how, why I'm crazy today. I know. I know. Um, okay, wait. So then I wanted to ask you too, the, oh, if there was like a, if you had a young, like 18 year old uh, sensitive ingenue who has been late mm-hmm. every day day for the first week of shooting like how how do you deal with that like as a leader because when I did house bunny I mean I wasn't directing it or anything but I did have a pretty sweet trailer Elizabeth (laughs) I mean (laughs) I'm not gonna get that trailer again (laughs) I have no doubt you were number one on the call sheet and number one on a call sheet is a really important role on on a set it's like it's it sets the tone for the entire film set. How would you deal with that kind of scenario? I'm sure you've had to deal with the managing of sensitive personalities like all across the board, right? Yeah. I, I think communication is what you try to do. Would you pull that person aside? Like how how yeah, or- private, of course. I mean, I usually try and bring a producer or someone else into the conversation so it doesn't feel unless that would feel like it's a gang up because I think that's never good either but I think being able to like try and meet that person where they are it's almost always an insecurity it's almost always something's going on You're so right that is not about the movie it's some personal insecurity that's going on or like you know I've not been in a situation where someone's being harassed or like they don't want to come to set for their safety or anything like that it's almost always some something in their heart or their brain and they just can't get past it and I'm not a therapist so it's really hard to get them past things like that, right? It's like, you're just trying to coax them to get the job done that day and and hope that you're helping them a little, you know, that you're bucking them up at the same time. There was an actress that was consistently late and I lost it. At first, I'd given her a couple gentle nudges, um, like, what can we do to make sure, you know, like, you need to make sure that this is part of what we do is, as we enter adulthood. Yeah, yeah. Be on you, uh, time. Have a professional job <laughs> that you're getting paid for and cashing a check. So if you're cashing the check, you should probably come. But then it was like seven in the morning. I've been there since like five thirty, getting like sewn into my costume or whatever. And this person was late again, and I just I became an animal. And then her parents came to work, and <laughs> like. It was like, shit, I did not handle that well. But I was so mad. And, and it was later in the shoot, too, so I was particularly hungry. You know how you yeah, kind of yeah, get, yeah. like... Oh, my God, you're starving all the time. 
Yeah. No, and you felt and you felt disrespected. Here's what I find too. I find that people who've had real jobs that are not acting jobs have a better understanding, right, of like the responsibility that we all have in like it's not your show. Even right. if it is your show. Like I you know, even if you are number one on the call sheet, there's an entire group of people around you waiting on you that want to go home to their wife and kids or their husband and kids or their dog or whatever. Everybody should be in the service industry totally. during a period of time in their life. Like it's I, just good. It's just good growth. It's good empathy. You know? Yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. And also, you know, and you, and you, it, it teaches you so many things. It teaches you empathy and it teaches you service of course, but it also teaches you um, how to stand up for yourself in the right way versus the way that gets you fired. Like, you know, right, and right, think, right. Because the other thing that happens here is I think people feel like, well, they shot me so they can't fire me. And then they act like a total asshole. That drives me completely insane. That sounds like a good story. <laughs> well, you know, there's just a sense of that sort of entitlement. Like, well, it's my name above the, you know, whatever. And I, I just find... I've had amazing working experiences with big, big, lovely actors who are know to treat the cast and crew and everyone's time respectfully. And of course, those are the much better experiences. You must be just such a dream to work with. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I let others, I'll let others speak to that. But I am very professional. I'll put it that way. Like I, I went to drama school. I, you know, I, went, I had a lot of jobs before I started doing this and I treat it you know, in that way, like respectfully, like I'm, I'm there. I want that from everyone else. So I'm very like golden rule, you know, about the whole thing. Okay. Now here are some life questions. You can answer them rapidly or not. Okay. What is your greatest fear? Oh, I, I won't even say it out loud. That's how great my fear is. Gotcha. But okay. it involves it. Yes. Death. I literally won't say it out loud. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Probably involves death. That's yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll give you that one. Yep. All right. Okay. What is a fear you had when you were younger that you no longer have? I used to, you know what it actually is? I was afraid of being embarrassed. And now I'm like, who the fuck cares? It's very hard to be embarrassed at this point in time. I mean, sure. Like, oh, well, you know, you're going to fuck up. You're going to do something stupid. You're going to look stupid. You're going to act stupid. And people might call you out. And like, that's on them. They're being mean. I think too that... Yeah, I think with Scary Movie, I got sprayed to the ceiling with sperm. I talk about this a lot. <laughs> but it is sort of like the liberation of embracing, like, I'm going to do stupid shit. And I yeah. also get paid for doing really embarrassing stuff sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I just find, like, even if I shit myself in public at this point in time, I'd be like, I mean, that's crazy, right, guys? <laughs> it happens, you know? It can happen to anybody. <laughs> Like, you, <gasps> you get a little hungover and have a couple lattes. Like, yeah. you, the, you, you can't do? get out of the cab while it's moving. I mean, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is your favorite sick rainy day movie? Ooh, I um, I have a lot. I recently watched Runaway Bride. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's like the least good Julia Roberts, <laughs> Richard Gere movie. <laughs> it's, but it's completely misogynistic, too. <laughs> and yet... I was like, these motherfuckers are so charming together. My God, it's fun to watch chemistry on screen. And like, I got a little titter. So maybe that one, if I'm alone in a room. All right. I can't get my husband or kids to watch that with me, though. <laughs> to whom would you most like to apologize and why? That's a really good question. I actually sort of went through this for myself in sort of working on myself a, a few years ago. And so I feel like I, I got some of this like sort of dealt with, which by the way, I recommend to everybody. Like if you have the nagging thing, like definitely do it. I, at this moment in time, no one is coming to me. I know. I was thinking how I would answer that. I feel like there's so many, but there also aren't. Like it, it's, it's. That's it, right. Yeah. I don't know how I would. The herd thins out. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely hurt people or I've disrespected people in the past and I really try now to like never leave that. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. the minute it should or can be acknowledged, I really try to just acknowledge it so that I don't have these like sleepless nights going like, oh my God, this person, and I, I have to call them or I have to deal with something. And so, yeah, I don't know. That makes sense because like apologizing immediately or like, you know, getting things worked out is such a position of strength. Okay. What is the trait you most dislike in yourself? I am impatient with my with everything 
<laughs> I have to practice patience for sure. I also, especially in this moment in time, feel like I, I gear up to do something and then it sort of pitters away. Like I get really excited about something yes, and then my follow through is like, ah, oh, wait, over here though is a shiny object. Totally. <laughs> well, it's like, yeah, hey, hey, look at this great idea. Somebody go do something with it. Like uh, somebody's got to do something with my great idea. <laughs> I'm someone who is known for being very decisive on so many levels. And honestly, I often want someone else to make the decision for me. Like, like getting yes. a green light on something, I'm like, or getting like a start date on something, that actually often becomes a thing that I go, okay, pivot. Now all my attention can go towards this. Completely. And I'm not great at like pretending to be super passionate about something if I know it's not actually going to maybe ha- – like I like things that are actually going to happen, do you know? I have a hard time. It's I don't know. I need to learn That's that something. skill. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like a cheerleader with like – well, sure, that seems like a pretty darn good idea. And then a few hours later, I'll be like, I don't know. I think that was a terrible <laughs> idea. And I- <laughs> um, What's the trait you most dislike in others? Um, I absolutely cannot stand it when people don't take responsibility for something that's gone wrong that is their fault. I love it that you say that. I think it's just like somebody who comes up to me with an excuse about something, it's like, no. Like, yeah. grow up. Yeah. Grow the fuck up. Like, just say you did it. I'm teaching my kids this too, right? It's like, it's not about the thing that went wrong. It's how you deal with it afterwards. So, right? It's like, I'm not going to be mad if you didn't turn your homework in. But if you lie to me and say you turned it in, like, I'm going to find out. And the lie is way worse. Or the excuses. Yes. So the excuses or the whatever. It's like, uh uh-uh. You have to take responsibility. Yeah. That drives me in fucking sane. I love it. I was having trouble with our stunt coordinator on Scary Movie 2. And I was, I'm like 23 and I'm newly arrogant. I had that flush, like, arrogance of Scary Movie 1 doing well, which was my first, you know, movie, essentially. Yeah. And this stunt coordinator was hard on us. And and I went up to Keenan and I said, you know, like, what do we do? Uh, you know, he's like a jerk or whatever. And Keenan was like, he just grinned at me. And he was <laughs> like, all right, well, you need to talk to him yourself. And I just was terrified. Like, okay, all right. All right, I got to step up to the plate now. And just like, talk to him. And how am I going to do that? And he must have known that I was coming. Keenan must have told him because he just had this big grin when I finally got the courage to say, hey, can we go for a walk? Um, so I feel like you're kind of, <laughs> he was like, I'm really glad you told me. <laughs> right. But but I'm so glad that he didn't fight a battle for me. Yeah. He was like, all right, you, you want to be a big girl, then you can handle it yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. You just reminded me of the person I would apologize to. I was in a musical in college And the guy who was the lead opposite me was very lovely and very talented. And I had an understudy who was a way better singer than me. And I was very insecure singing these songs. And I treated him badly because I was insecure and kind of a jerk about it. So that's why I would apologize too. That's amazing. Yeah. There's like, I think it's really important to reflect on those experiences a bit as, as you know, I like to think of myself that I was always kind, but I wasn't. Yeah, that's right. And I think also for me getting older, the best part about it is like, I'm not in constant like power struggles because that's usually what that's about too, right? Like I'm not that insecure. You need to have more power than me in this moment. You take it away. (laughs) Like, you know, I'm good with who I am now. So that to me is one of the best things about getting older actually. And like leaving so much of that behind because that is really I find where so much unkindness from me came from it was me feeling like I either didn't have power I wasn't secure I felt like a fake like you know all those things that we all feel and you know now it's like okay I feel way more settled and secure I love that well all right so who would you invite to your dream dinner party I feel like it changes all the time I'm constantly like interested in people at certain moments, you know? Yeah. I'm for like futurists and people who are, I don't know, like solving things that like, I want to know, I would want to collect like really great minds. It's like at this point in time, I want to put them together with like activists. And then I want to put them together with money people. And I want to like make things better. <laughs> you know? I mean, I really think, well, I don't know what moment we're in now that coronavirus is a pandemic all over the world and we're all staying home and 
and no one's at work. And I mean, I have no idea what comes after this. I think we're going to have to really figure this out. Like, do we want what we had before when this is over? Because I feel like the curtain has been sort of pulled back yes. now. And we're, and we're looking at things and we're looking at people who don't have health care. And we're looking at people who don't have basics to like take care of themselves. You know, all of those people that got talked about in the primaries who like a $400 you know, Bill could like put them into bankruptcy. Like that's the thing that matters to me most, I think, right now. It's going to be like a pretty fucking serious dinner party, I think. (laughs) It would be, but I'd sprinkle in some comedians at the same time. I'd have, you know, some Jeff Garland's and some Larry (laughs) David's or something. In one word, how would you like to be remembered? Mom. Oh, that was oddly immediate and wonderful and beautiful. I oh. mean, I don't I don't think there'll be anything more important. I don't know. I'm nine years old. I into mean, have it. you really thought about it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe grandma. <laughs> I, ho- I hope I get to be a grandma. I hope I'm around. I hope the earth's around. I you know, who the hell knows what's happening. This episode is brought to you in part by Plant Botanical. As everyone slowly comes out of hiding, many of you are asking the same questions. Am I ready for actual human contact? Should I swipe right? Will they look like their picture? Do I look like my picture? Is that the face of an ax murderer? Do I really wanna take off these sweats? And for those of you who get that far, what drink should I be casually sipping? I have the answer to that one. While your date sits awkwardly silent, stunned by your good looks, dazzled by your intellect, or wondering how to dispose of your body, the drink in your hand should be delicious, refreshing, crisp, clean, plant botanical vodka seltzer. Weighing in at only one carb, made with real fruit and botanicals traditionally used for stamina, immunity, and detox, Plant Botanical is already thinking about your future encounters. Follow and DM at Plant Loves You and share a story or video of your funniest, wildest, or most awkward date for a chance to win up to $1,000 for your next one. Plant Botanical, your perfect companion while you look for your perfect companion. Available at Target, Pavilions, Vons, Total Wine, or visit plantlovesyou.com to find a store near you. Plant Vodka and Vodka Seltzer, just the good shit. Okay, now we're going to give some unqualified advice to our listeners. <laughs> okay. Hello. Hi, Ryan. This is Anna. Hi. Hi. And I have Elizabeth Banks here. Hi. That's so awesome. Hello. <laughs> Will you tell us what's going on? Yeah, so I've been with my boyfriend for about six months. We both live at home, so he lives with his mom and I live with my aunt. Um, but pretty much I stay there every day. <laughs> and so I've got a really great relationship with his whole family and it's going really well. And so my birthday is in a few weeks and we've been planning a trip to Disney World because his sister was doing the Disney College program. Um, and then obviously everything started happening with the coronavirus and the lockdowns and all of that. So our trip was canceled and she was sent home. So now that she's living with us again, everything, you know, seems fine. I've got a great relationship with her as well. Um, And then on Monday, I talked to his mom about like, if we actually went on like a statewide lockdown, could I stay there? And she said, yes. And that was totally fine. So that was the plan. And so then when we actually went on the lockdown, his sister's got a lot of issues with like anxiety and things like that. And she had this panic attack about not wanting anyone in the house, not wanting anyone to leave. Um, and we couldn't calm her down until I agreed to go home. Um, so it's mm. kind of like threw everything off. And so now I'm living at home and not able to see him. So just trying to figure out like how to keep our relationship strong and how to like, I mean, I'm not mad at her, of course. Like I understand her feelings and everything, but just sort of navigating the situation. Mm-hmm. First of all, Ryan, it sounds like you're being really generous just in in general but yeah and respectful yeah but but how old is is the sister uh she is 25 does she have a boyfriend i wonder if this came out of like relationship envy part of me thinks a little bit of it was like jealousy because she does um but she wasn't able to see him because she had flown so she was already like quarantined so i think me getting to see him every day then her not being able to do that was a little bit of part of it as well right so you were quarantined with his family together you guys were hanging Mm -hmm. out Yes. The sister 
was there. She had a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Were you guys leaving the house? Like, what was her panic attack actually about? That you guys were bringing COVID-19 into the house or what? So he is currently laid off of work and I'm working from home now, but that day was the last day that I I had to go into the office and come back. Right. So I was gone when it happened and then they made the announcement. So if you guys, now that you're on your lockdown, if you guys just do like a nice 14 day apart, and you guys all promise like not go to work and not see other people. Can't you just go back over there in a couple of weeks and be like, hey, I haven't seen anybody. I've spent my time at home and now I'm here with you. I guess it really just depends on like how she reacts to it. Cause she, I mean, like he wanted to go to the store and she like freaked out. Yeah. Here's what I think. I mean, you know, she worked at Disneyland. Like they shut down Disneyland for the first time. Like this is stressful for yeah. so many people on so many levels. And I know you're at the beginning of a relationship. So it's tough because you guys want to hang out. And I bet you want to do even more than hanging out because I've been in the beginning of relationships. So I know how they go. Um, <laughs> and I think you guys got to be really generous and respectful with her right now. Because it sounds to me like she's just having mass anxiety, which I know so many people are because people are really freaked out by this virus and what's going on. And we feel like misinformed and we don't know what the hell's happening. And I, I get that. So I don't know. I think you got to like zoom with the boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Can he come live with you and your aunt? So we had talked about that too, but that was part of her whole thing. It's like, I don't want anyone to leave the house. I don't want anyone to. So in order to get her to chill, we just agreed to doing it this way. And I know he's pretty upset with her. They're really close outside of this. Yeah. And I'm trying to just like not make this be a problem once the month is over. You know, not like strain any of our relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's smart for the long term. I get what you're saying. You want to make sure that you don't become a wedge between the two of them because that could maybe not go your way in the future. Yeah, exactly. And Ryan, I have to hand it to you. I think the way that you are sort of describing her like it's really mature of you that you're that you phrase all of this like you know she's prone to anxiety and her life is like you know been upended and that's really remarkable that you phrased everything in your email with a lot of generosity I don't know if I would have done the same thing I would have been like (laughs) but good for you can I ask one like kind of controversial question Mm mm-hmm Is there any way that the sister threw this fit at the behest of her brother because he actually thought maybe it was moving too fast and he didn't want to live with you during the quarantine? I really don't think so. I think he's been a lot more upset about this than I even have been. Oh, so that's good to know. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Because you know how in relationships, like when one person is really upset, the other person tends to counterbalance. Yeah. So if he's really upset, maybe it can make you a little bit of like a stable anchor. Yeah. Sounds like that is what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I am sorry, but I love it that you're in love. (laughs) Yay! I know. That's amazing. So I'm happy that you found somebody. And yes, I know it's so hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be a human being right now in general. But I will say, I think if you guys make it through this, it's going to mean a lot in the future going forward. And by the way, this will be like the beginning. Remember when we had to be all quarantined? (laughs) Ha ha ha. Let's hope we're all telling that story 30 years from now at your like anniversary party. (laughs) I will say though, the last thing that happened the night before I had to move out. I realized he had never seen House Buddy. So it's the last thing we watched. Oh. So I'm very glad about that. Oh, Ryan, that's <laughs> really sweet. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> hey, Ryan. I think you, you've you handled this very, very maturely. I really do. I think a lot of other people would have just, you know, matched her anxiety level. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Good luck. Oh, Good thanks, luck, Ryan. Ryan. Thank you. Bye, Ryan. Thank you. Bye. Hello. Hi, Melissa. It's Anna Ferris. Hi, Anna. Hi. Um, I'm here with Elizabeth Banks. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Elizabeth. Oh my gosh. How are you doing? Are you are you guys on lockdown? Well, I um, have been deemed essential for whatever reason. Oh. So I'm still going to work, but my children are home right now until April 24th is a new date. Oh my goodness. How old are your kids? I have an 11 year old and a nine year old. Ooh. So they're kind of going crazy right now and driving me insane, but that's okay. It's part of the, the deal, you know? Yeah. I know. It's kind of where we are all at. Well, I, I hope you're staying safe and healthy, Melissa. 
I am trying. Thank you for working during yeah. this time. That must be really difficult to be juggling all these things. Oh my gosh, this is such a nice, wonderful little, you know, amidst everything going on. This is so wonderful. Thank you guys so much for, you know, having me tell my little sob story. <laughs> Let's hear it. Can we hear it? Well, long story short, I've been with this guy for seven years and there's still no ring. There's still no anything. And, you know, it is definitely something that I expressed that I wanted earlier on. I am divorced. I got divorced when I was 29 and we started dating about like a year and a half later. At first it was just very casual. I wasn't planning on it turning into anything. And then it did. And then, you know, after some time passed, he met my kids, which was, you know, that is very hard to do. And of course, my kids love him. And and he's so amazing to my children and to me, to be fair. You know, he's a great guy. Do you guys live together? Yes. And and that's kind of that's kind of on the flip side of things is where are you in the house right now, Melissa? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, well, let me just say that it is my house. I, after my divorce, I, I really never thought I would be able to buy my own home again, but I made it happen and it's just mine. Uh-huh. That was kind of the thing. You know, he's like, oh, I'd love to, you know, get married one day. We can do it one day, you know, but we should buy a house and do this or that. And I said, no, that doesn't really sound like the way it's supposed to happen. You know, so many things could go wrong. And I just didn't feel that that would have been right. So I did buy my house by myself. Right. And I don't really like talking to my girlfriends about it because right. they're your girlfriends. They're like, oh, whatever, girl, like just dump his ass. Like, you know, you'll be fine. <laughs> does he have a job he does that's actually that's how we met we do work we don't really work together we work in the same kind of office park so he does have a job does he like it i think he likes his job because you know he likes to live in his comfort zone right mm-hmm I'm not really like that. Um, So, Melissa, though, now on a different thing, you wrote in your email something really interesting. You said you guys were at a wedding and you asked him about marriage and his reply was... Do you know what my friends would say? That broke my heart. And I don't know what it means because, you know, we were at a wedding. Of course, this wedding. I love when weddings have after parties because it's like, why? We've already had way too much to drink. (laughs) So we just we had way too much to drink. And of course, I said something, you know, about marriage because Hello, this wedding. is like the 11th wedding that we've been to as a just boyfriend, girlfriend couple. It's freaking humiliating. And that is exactly what he said. And when I asked him what that meant, he kept saying, I don't know. I didn't mean it. And well, but this has happened so many times with like different answers. Like sometimes it'll be, oh, well, you know, I think we should buy a house first. Well, I bought a house. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just a piece of paper. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's always an excuse. Yeah, yeah. But he says, well, it'll it'll happen. And I'm just like, dude, you're just wasting my time, I feel like. I have a question. Um, do you respect him? I do. I really do. I mean, I think, obviously, I have a bit of resentment, I guess you could say, right now. But I do respect him, especially because of, of what, you know, I have to be fair. He's taken on... You know, I mean, I have two kids. He really has taken that role as, you know, being a part of their life very seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So I I do respect him. I really do. I ask that because, you know, there might just be something going on with him when it comes to the idea of marriage that maybe just needs a little like tender, loving respect. And I don't know what it is. He obviously doesn't know what it is. He's having a hard time communicating it to you, obviously. I don't know. I mean, look, for me, I'm like, if you're in it, you want it. It's not a piece of paper. Like it's your safety. It's your health care. It's your taxes. Like it means a lot to be married. I'm a proponent of marriage. I think it's a good thing for everybody involved when it's right. And, and you're in it together as it's a real partnership. I find it interesting that you say like, it's your house. It's my house. And he's like living there. And so I don't know. I just think there's there's a little power imbalance is what I'm sensing right now a little bit. Yeah, totally. And I think that that, too, is. 
something I need to work on because that's just my, I guess you could say my baggage from coming out of a divorce where in my marriage, I didn't have any idea what type of situation we were in financially. I didn't have control over really anything. And so I feel like a lot of the things that I've been able to give back to myself after my divorce, it means so much to me because I had to work so much harder for it. And I don't really see him working hard for anything. Mm. You know, he always said, well, I really think that we should buy a home first, but... He didn't do anything to make a house buy happen, right? Uh, Oh, oh, no, 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 (laughs) no. It was an idea that he had, but like most of his ideas, they never end up happening. Right. Does he pay you rent? That is kind of where the other half of the marriage thing comes in. Like, he's like, I want to pay half. I want to do this. I want to do that. And in my mind, because I'm very unhappy right now at my job and I kind of want to find another job knowing that I'll have to start lower on the totem pole. Yeah. It'd be nice to, if we were in this marriage and it's like, okay, go ahead. You can quit your job for less. You know, we'll make it work this and that. But for me, I'm like, well, you're just my boyfriend. I mean, you could walk out at any minute. Yeah. I also wonder, do you get external pressure to get married from your family? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, his family is kind of more on that side of things, whereas my family is very relaxed. They kind of fully support whatever it is that I want to do or don't want to do. And we've been to plenty of weddings for his side of the family. And every single time we go up to the bride and give her a hug and congratulate her, oh, when are you guys getting married? Right. (laughs) Meanwhile, she just married this guy that she's only been dating for like a year and a half. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a partnership is really what you're looking for, right? So he's not, quote, paying rent. He's not helping with the mortgage, even though he lives there? Okay, so I pay the mortgage, but he basically pays everything else. Like on the inside of the house, he does, you know, the whole... The whole internet, the cable, the electricity, he buys Got all it. the groceries. He definitely pulls his weight. So that's good. That's great. That's a partnership. I guess I'm digging a little bit, trying to understand what it is about getting married that you need that you're not getting in the current setup. Because he's fathering your kids. He's paying some bills. He's going to work. He's supportive of you in, in these ways. It's like, what are you not getting besides the, the sort of piece of paper and the wedding from him? that you would want. Right. And I think, you know, because this is, it kind of goes back to that sort of how he responds to it, except for he just gets completely, I don't want to say hostile, not like violent, but he gets really angry anytime it's brought up. And I will tell you, it's maybe only been brought up about three times in our entire relationship of almost seven years. And I think for me, it's just like, he's asking why And I'm asking, well, why not? Yeah. Is it just me that you don't want to marry? I mean, what? Uh, I think that we have a lot of pressure to get married. You know, it's like checking something off the list. It's like our parents ask. You know what I mean? It's just out there. It's just out there. So that's one thing. So just, you know, just understand that we all go through it with varying degrees. But the other thing about his friends, does he have close guy friends or Mm. no and so mm. why is he worried about what his friends would say Anna we would have to have a whole separate other segment for (laughs) me to be able to explain (laughs) that situation because long story short he these people that he used to be friends with or whatever they know my ex-husband Oh. When we started dating, I don't know if he didn't want to tell them or I, I don't know. Right. But no, I mean, I couldn't have, I literally couldn't have a better ex-husband. I mean, oh, that's great. That's unusual. That's they amazing. have an amazing relationship and he totally appreciates the dynamic between our kids and, you know, my boyfriend. And I don't understand why he just stopped talking to his friends, but he did. And Mm. so when he said, do you know what my friends would think? I didn't say it, but I was thinking, what friends? Right. I mean, this is a conversation we've had many times. Why don't you call anybody and you know, yeah. go hang out or go watch a game somewhere. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, you know how, like, asking big, important questions is kind of all about timing. And oftentimes we always do it at the worst time because it's usually <laughs> when we're, like, you know, feeling highly emotional. But. Yeah. Drunk at the wedding. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I wonder. Oh, well, the last time, too, I would, like, brought it up while we were watching 
the Real Housewives of New Jersey reunion, and I'm like, <laughs> oh great, she got proposed to twelve times. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh girl you know obviously with everyone sort of being on lockdown and all this craziness and i know that you're still working but i think that like the timing is crazy right now so to just put additional like stress on to, i think it's treading lightly for a minute but i think in a couple weeks where it's like you know i wanted to talk to you about this and i love you it's important to me to know where we're going it's important to me to know where i'm going in my life. And I think, Melissa, you need to be able to answer when he says to you, I give you everything already. What's the difference? It's just a piece of paper. I think you really need to have your answer, your honest, true answer ready to go. It's not about money. And it's not, it's like you want the security of your future. You want him to be a real father to your kids. You want a real family with him. You want to make a family together. Like, you want the security of him in your life. You want a partnership, right? I think you just got to be really clear that it's not like, I just want to have a, a white dress or like, you know, it's societal pressure or my, right, your sister right, right. keeps asking. like, Or even like the ceremony, like I wouldn't bring that. I think yeah, Elizabeth's nothing. totally on to something. It's got to be like, why is this man supposed to be wed to you forever and ever? Right. If you can't answer that question for yourself, why should he answer it? Right. Damn, Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I totally appreciate that. I mean, because you are absolutely right. I wish you love and luck, girl. Love and luck. Thank you so much, Melissa. I love you guys so much. I love you. Thank you guys so much. Stay safe out there. Thanks, You Melissa. too. Stay safe and healthy. In there. Stay in there. Safe. In yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Melissa. Bye. Do you have a favorite joke? My favorite jokes, and this is partially because I can't ever remember any jokes, so I committed to memory a long time ago. What used to be referred to as dumb blonde jokes, right? Listen, we're just we're just two blondes just talk. Yeah, two blondes we're just, hanging out here. Yeah, my roots um, are coming in though, Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me too, babe. Me too. So, this is my favorite joke. My favorite dumb blonde joke, and I'll call them dumb blondes. They could be anything. Just people who don't know what's up. So. Two blondes go walking in the forest. And the first one looks down and says, oh, look, bear tracks. And the other one says, mm -mm, I, I think that those are deer tracks. And the first one says, nah, -uh, they're bear tracks. And the second one says, girl, they definitely deer tracks. And the first one says, bear tracks, deer tracks, bear tracks, deer tracks, bear tracks, deer tracks. And then the train hit them. <laughs> That's my favorite dumb blonde joke. <laughs> hey, Elizabeth, I love you and thank you. You're you. amazing, truly. I had a great partner in this conversation, so thank you. Bye, love you. Bye. Bye.